properties of definite integrals are as follows. If you kind of look at this, and if you realize that the definition of the definite integral is based on this limit, it's really not too hard to see most of what these properties are. For example, uh, if you go, if you do a definite integral of a constant times a function on some interval, then you can factor that c out, constant will come out, and you can just do the definite integral of the function by itself, and then just multiply that by that constant. Reason being is because, see, this is nothing but a fancy sum anyway, all right? So most of the properties of, properties of summations are inherited by definite integrals because they are just sums. Uh, second example here. The definite integral of, of a sum or a difference of functions is the sum or difference of the definite integrals of the, 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 those functions, and that, which means that you can break apart definite integrals uh, with respect to addition or subtraction. For example here, uh, evaluate this, the definite integral from minus 1 to 1 of x plus 1. You can interpret that as the area of this triangle here. All right, here's minus 1. So here's minus 1 and 1, and it just makes a triangle whose base and height are 2. So it's going to be 1 half base times height. And right, so 1 half of 4 is 2. You could have alternatively have done that by breaking it up. I don't know how much easier it is, but it's good for an example. The integral from minus 1 to 1 of x plus 1 is the same thing as the integral from minus 1 to 1 of x dx um, plus the integral from minus 1 to 1 of 1 dx. Now, if you look at these individually, the integral of x dx from minus 1 to 1, well, that's just, that's going to be this and that, right? That integral is going to bounce out to give you 0. And then if you look at this, the integral of 1 dx, well, that's a bunch of rectangles, the, the height of which are all 1. So here's 1 minus 1. It's just the area of that big rectangle, whose base is 2, whose height is 1. So you get two either way. Uh, here's an obvious one. If you integrate a function from a to a, you're essentially doing a Riemann sum and finding the area of nothing. It's the area underneath a point on a curve. And so hence, when you do that, you're going to get zero. So whenever the boundaries are, are the same, by definition, it's going to be zero. This is a tricky one. Right? This says that if you take the boundaries and you switch them, uh, the sign of the, the definite integral switches with it. Uh, for example, if you're confronted with this thing here, all right, if you say from minus 2 pi to 2 pi, I mean from 2 pi to a pi, you say, all right, when you look at that, it's kind of funny because the lower bound is higher than the upper bound. So the way that you're going to want to look at that is you see this and think, okay, this is tough because the bounds are out, out of order. It's a lot easier to read if I switch up the boundaries, sign x dx. But in doing so, it's going to incur a minus sign here. But this is easy to read. And you can see from here, the integral from pi to 2 pi is minus 2. So it's going to be the opposite of minus 2 or 2. Try not to get carried away with you know integrating to the left or right and whether it's above or below the x-axis. All that you have to think of is, whenever you switch the bounds, throw a negative sign in there. And the way that you can think of that is, switching the boundaries sort of switches the way that we tr traditionally calculate our delta x's. Um, if we have some sample points here, if here is like x1 and x2 and x3, we would calculate ordinarily, this would be delta x1, and you would get that from subtracting the x values. x2 minus x1 would give you x1 because you subtract the smaller one from the larger one. Think of switching the boundaries as performing your subtractions in the opposite direction, thereby making all of your delta x's negative in value, thereby switching the value of the integral. Uh, this latest property, uh, sort of a transitive property here. No big thing though, if you integrate a function from a to b, which will give you the area here, and then to it, you add the integral from b to c, which is this here, you, would, you get the same result as though you had integrated the original function from a straight to b. That's no big deal. A uh, question that you might ask, though, is 
under what circumstances will these integrals exist? When do these limits exist and when do they not exist? There are two conditions for existence of definite integrals. Uh, the one is boundedness, which means that the function that you're integrating has to be bounded on the interval which you're integrating it on. Um, this is an example of an of that violates boundedness. Because one over x, you know, looks like that. And if you try to integrate this on an interval containing zero or um, open at zero, you say from here to here, when you go to carve this region up and you write out that sum, right, uh, one over x k star delta x k, when you pick x k stars, x one star over here, its value is going to blow up. Right? It, it gets infinitely large. It just gets larger and larger and larger without bound. Therefore, if you do this kind of limit, what you get is infinity. It is not a number because the curve is un unbounded. And so the definite integral is said to fail to exist. So boundedness is one of the conditions. And the other condition, which is a strange condition, the function that you're integrating has to have finitely many discontinuities means if it has any discontinuities, you have to be able to count them. Uh, for example here, this is a perfectly integrable function, even though it's discontinuous here and here. If you do this kind of limit, right, g of x k star, it all comes back to this. If you were to do this kind of sum with this function, you would only get a bunch of rectangles here over the entire thing. And what you're going to wind up with is just the area of this whole shape here, one, two, three, four. So that's perfectly in integrable, that's fine. Same thing goes for something like this. There is a discontinuity, discontinuity here. In fact, there's no point on the curve at all here, but you can still integrate f of x from a to b without any problem. Once again, because when you perform this kind of summation, f of x k star delta x k, as long as this x value is not chosen as one of your delta, as one of your x k stars, you'll, you'll be all right. And it's integrable and, and it's fine. I tell my students that you really have to think hard to come up with, with a function that has infinitely many discontinuities and is therefore unintegrable. This is one such example. It comes out of your worst nightmares. Um, zero of x is rational and one of x is irrational. What could the graph of such a function look like? Well, let's just examine it on, say, 0 to 1. Well, between any two real numbers, there are an infinitude of rational and irrational numbers, no two of which are actually next to one another. So if you go to graph this, what you, you just get like a series of dots here, a bunch of dots, top and bottom. It's more like a dust, right? As far in as, far as you try to zoom, you just keep getting more and more of this, you know, discontinuous behavior. In fact, this function is discontinuous everywhere. And so if you try to set up one of these limits, x, k, star, delta x, k, you're going to fail. No matter how small you make your mesh, no matter how many rectangles that you use to try to get something of value out of this, uh, the thing is going to diverge. It's going to constantly, your heights are going to constantly jump between 0 and 1, and you're not going to get anything. So this is the example of um, non-integrability by uh, having infinitely many discontinuities. Of course, uh, in later courses, you find that there are exceptions to both of these rules, but that's a topic for some other time.